Um, welcome you all uh, to discuss a very important topic, um, hemostasis, bleeding. We all have encountered it in some or the other way, clinically, non-clinically, at home or otherwise. Um, so we will be talking about a little bit about normal pathophysiology, um, how the bleeding occurs and how does it stops, why do patients bleed, um, and then types of bleeding and then what you should do and what you should not do, which is very important. So how does it occur? Basically four steps. First, there is a wound. Um, it could be an external wound or internal wound, intraoral, extraoral, a cut, tooth extraction, anything which causes trauma to the normal um, integrity of your epithelium, which is your skin, or your mucosa. And then there's a vascular phase. So as soon as the trauma occurs, the vessels around that, they start to contract. And this is in preparation to form a um, clot or a plug. The platelets come to that area, they stick and they form a clot, which then gets stabilized um, by various clotting factors, which are again produced by liver. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how those factors are produced, but as you can clearly see that any problem in production of these clotting factors or the platelets can alter the hemostasis. And then what happens after that, once the clot is formed and stabilized, it stays there for a while and then goes through a process called as fibrinolysis, which in some patients, if it occurs early, it can start to cause reactionary hemorrhage after a few hours or a few days. Um, also, if there is any problems in terms of um, the vascular phase or the platelet phase, again, you can encounter primary bleeding, which we'll discuss. So as you're operating or taking a tooth out, you can, um, you can end up with bleeding or catastrophe, which is very difficult to control. So even if your clotting factors are normal, um, but there's an issue with the platelet count or the platelet quality, the quality of the clot form will not be good enough to sustain. So that's the basic <laughs> physiology, and that is both intraoral, extraoral on your skin. This is how the bleeding stops. Once the clot is degraded, then it gets formed into epithelium or mucosa, depending on where the bleeding is occurring from. What happens then? So if there is a surgery or a procedure being done in the mouth, even if it's a simple scaling, you're basically causing trauma to the integrity of your mucosa or epithelium. And because of that, there is either a transection of the a vascular structure, so it could be muscle, bone, neurovascular bundles, or capillaries. And that can cause bleeding, oozing, or um, hemorrhage. Also, the vascularity is increased if the tissue is inflamed. So suppose a patient comes to you with periodontitis or gingivitis, the vessels around that area would be inflamed, which means they are not normally, um, normally strong enough to um, sort of sustain your <coughs> surgical trauma. And even with a minimal, uh, minimal surgical intervention, it'll start to bleed. So you just probe and the patient starts to bleed. And that is not normal because the area is inflamed. So you have to keep in mind with such patients that has the inflammation altered the um, you know, this anatomy or the structure of that area. Um, again, it, if it is arterial, so if you have actually cut through an artery, um, the bleeding would be like pulsatile that will follow the pulsations of the artery. That's a good way to distinguish whether it's a capillary, which will slowly ooze, or venous blood, which is more than a capillary, but then it will not be pulsatile. Whereas arteries, so inferior, inferior alveolar artery or a buccal artery, they will be very pulsatile bleeding. Um, so these are good indicators of where the blood is coming from. Again, atriovenous malformation. So often these patients are like uh, suffering from a pathology, AV shunt, or AV aneurysm, or these sort of things. And if you sort of, it's undiagnosed, and the patient is a special needs patient who is not really um, cooperative enough for an OPG, you don't know whether there's a pathology existing, take a tooth out and it starts to um, bleed catastrophically. So these are the things you need to keep in mind, that there could be a um, atriovenous malformation in that area, which has sort of led to um, hemorrhage. So always try to check the x-ray first, examination and history, which is paramount in um, controlling bleeding. So we've dis discussed the local causes. Again, inf infection and inflammation, they can alter the normal anatomy and physiology of the area. So the platelets will not be able to adhere or form a clot and stabilize. Trauma, again, another cause for bleeding. Now, systemic causes, which is one of the main causes of bleeding in our patients which come here, they're often on drugs um, which alter the normal clotting or bleeding profile of a patient. For example, patients on anticoagulants, patients on valves, um, patients on, um, with pulmonary embolism, or these sort of things. They are often on drugs which are called as blood thinners in patients' terms. 
and they alter the normal clot formation or normal hemostasis. So that's what we are going to discuss, how to deal with, this pati with these patients and manage the um, hemorrhage. And then there are other diseases. So patients suffering from um, hereditary or congenital diseases, hemophilia. So you need to take the history, whether it runs in the family. It could be that you are the first person to diagnose um, these patients who have hemophilia but never have uh, been diagnosed, or von Willebrand's disease. So these are the familial diseases, which often dentist is the first person who diagnoses it in a patient. Again, um, as we were talking about failure to produce factors. So the clotting factors, which again lead to the stabilization of the clot, they can be altered in chronic alcoholics or malnutritions, liver cirrhosis. So a patient, if, if you've failed to um, ask them how long they have been consuming alcohol for and their liver is compromised, their clotting factors will be compromised. So it's not that we can do anything about it. You'll not send the patient for a liver transplant, but you can manage that patient better um, in terms of taking the tooth out or doing any surgery in the mouth. Um, again, patients who are um, vitamin deficient, because vitamin K helps in formation of, that, of those clotting factors. So these sort of things um, you have to keep in mind when you are even doing a simple extraction or something like a periodontal or a gingival, um, uh, gingival procedure. Failure to produce platelets. So patients with bone cancer, irradiation, they do not have normal marrow, which is very healthy and produces your normal um, blood um, platelets or blood cells. They're often prone to infections and their platelets are not of good quality. So these are the things, again, to keep in mind. Renal diseases, again, patients with burns and sepsis, their um, clot formation is, again, altered. And then loss of platelets, so patients with splenomegaly, where the spleen is enlarged, the platelets are again lost or they are not in the sufficient quantity. So these patients, if they have had a history of renal disease or um, HIV or other autoimmune diseases, it's good to send them for a full blood, full blood count just to know what their platelet number is. And then we can sort of triage them, whether you can manage them appropriately with normal hemostatic measure, whether you need to refer to the cardiologist, hematologist, whether would, would they need platelet transfusion, those sort of things. Um, and then hereditary diseases. So what's their um, factor eight? What's the family, uh, family history of factor eight? So normal factor eight, 37%, but then these patients are quite aware sometimes, their histories are at Royal Children, and their family knows how to manage these patients, where exactly they need the transfusion, when would they need it, these sort of things. It's always good to check. And what are the drugs these, some of these patients are on? So they are on various types of anticoagulants, which have been used since ages. Obviously not this one, but there's another form of warfarin which these patients are on. Um, heparin and low molecular weight heparin, which is um, Clexane, Plavix, which is Clopidogrel, and then Aspirin. All these drugs alter with platelets or bleeding profile in some or the other way. And they are basically blood thinners because the aim for these um, drugs is to prevent the formation of clot and prevent the thromboembolic event, which can again cause to myocardial infarction, infarction or stroke. Now the risk of, a, risk of stopping these drugs and subjecting the patient to a thromboembolic event is far higher than your risk of hemorrhage from an extraction. And this is proven by various studies. So the current literature says that do not stop the drug at any cost, unless the patient is going for a very extensive um, surgery, and that will be done in a hospital setting. You would be liaising with the patient's hematologist, with the cardiologist, and various other specialists before you actually decide to stop the drug. Often, uh, we get patients who have already stopped the drug on their own by the advice of their local dentist, and they say that I've stopped the asp aspirin yesterday. That's not going to really affect in any way because it takes seven days for the um, effect of aspirin to actually really work for us in um, pr promoting the platelets. So it's really education around when to stop, when not to stop, and what to do if you really want to stop. So talk to the general physician, talk to the hematologist, and often um, one patient is a good way to sort of communicate to them that please do not advise your patients to stop. It was quite surprising when some of the general physicians were unaware that what's the risk of thromboembolic event, um, which is roughly two to 5% compared to a normal hemorrhage from extraction. And they often advise their patients that, yep, stop the heparin or stop the aspirin and you can go to your dentist and then the patients are adamant that they will bleed to death if they start taking the drug. Um, 
so you will not bleed to death. We've got stuff which we can <laughs> help to stop the bleeding, but you will die if you have a myocardial infarction by stopping your drug. So that's the thing which we really need to reiterate here. And these are some of the new anticoagulants. And um, the problem with these is we cannot really investigate how they are going to affect the bleeding or the clotting profile. They are quite predictable in their mode of action, but to investigate what's the level of platelets or how they are affecting the clotting, it's a long, tedious, and a very expensive process. So basically, the current guideline says do not stop these drugs, just use local hemostatic measures. Talk to the general physician, talk to the hematologist. Um, again, bleeding types. So one, uh, one is your immediate. As you are doing the procedure, you sort of can see that this patient is really oozy. Often under general anesthesia, if I see that the patient is really oozing or bleeding um, away from the normal course, I would talk to the anesthetist. Is the patient really hypertensive? What's the blood pressure? Is, it, is he bleeding because of um, the hypertension? Or is it because the tissue is inflamed? Is it because the patient has had infection and pericoronitis? <coughs> are these the reasons which are really causing the bleeding? Or have we missed something in the history that the patient has been on and that's what is causing the bleeding? So assess your scenario. Why is the patient bleeding at that time? And um, how are you going to progress from then onwards? Delayed primary. So this, this is the most common cause of bleeding in our patients. Loss of clot. Patient actually likes to play what's there in their mouth. When the local anesthetic starts to wear off, their tongue starts to dig around that hole and the clot gets lost, they smoke, they have a kappa, hot kappa. Uh, you never know what happens after the extraction. Next day or even at night, primary care, emergency services, they get a call. Our MaxFax registrar gets a call. The patient is bleeding. They had wisdom teeth in the morning. Um, slight ooze is normal, which is what our registrar talks to them and tells them how to stop the bleeding. Just bite on the gauze and don't poke around it. That's what we tell them for 20 minutes. But um, if it's unexpected, if it's sporadic, if it's pulsatile, get them in if you can, or go to your nearest MaxFax um, hospital, wherever the unit is, or emergency. So need to assess why exactly the bleeding has occurred. You need to take the history from the patient. What have they been doing after the procedure? And secondary, this usually occurs seven days after the procedure, and that is because of the infection. So basically, the site has got inflamed. There is inflammation in the vessels, and that's causing oozing and um, sort of secondary bleed. So that's something which we need to really explore, see if there is infection due to remnant root. There is some tissue degradation, does the patient need um, cleaning, curettage in that area, take a radiograph, examine, and then proceed from there onwards. But history is very important in managing any patient. So treat all the patients as if they are probably going to bleed. Um, and then see whether there is anything which flags concern. So liver disease, alcoholism, renal disease, malignancy, these sort of things. Often patients do not know the name of their tablets. They'll just tell, I take a blue one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Make the effort of calling their GP and ask them, what exactly is the patient on? How long? So these, um, these are the things which will actually prevent a catastrophe. And then family, family history is always helpful. What we do, if we see any of these a concern for us, we usually send them for a full blood examination, check their levels. So for us, 80,000 is all right. Um, each each specialty, each clinician has their own um, level of calling it the shot. Some people consider that too low. Some people consider that critical. Critical platelet count is different, basically. So where I come from, India, we used to treat patients with 50,000 because we would use local hemostatic measures and go ahead with that. Um, an oral surge, anything below 80, we don't really um, advise unless we are really comfortable with uh, achieving primary hemostasis. And then I think primary care would probably 100,000, 100, something like that. Um, coagulation screen, there is evidence that they usually are not very conclusive. So if the patient is on newer anticoagulants, by checking their APTT or prothrombin time, not going to be really helpful. INR is really helpful. INR is a blood test where patients, it's called as international normalized ratio. So the prothrombin time of patient compared to a standard, it should be one normally. So in a normal patient, it would be one. Um, up to 
or 4 or 4.5, we are happy to take those patients and do the procedure under normal hemostatic measures. But if it's more than that, we would want the INR to come down if it's an exhaustive surgery, or we would at least like a backup with us. So we would call the um, physician tranexamic acid. It's a standard protocol for any patient whose INR is more than one. We would actually keep it as a backup. We would tell the patients that this is what we would um, use. But the, also the other thing which is a good indicator is um, if the patient has had a higher INR, but then we've had ex we've done extractions on them in the past and the clot has been achieved after some time, then that's a good indicator that they usually clot and the clot stays. So again, go by what the patient's history has been. Uh, some patients bleed despite of normal INR. You do not know what exactly the defect is. It could be in the capillaries. It could be in the platelet quality. So these are the things which are a good indicator. And ask the patient, have you had um, extraction before? How did it bleed a lot? So the patient would obviously be able to give you some more information in that regard. So lot test, as I was talking before, that's the normal range. And then again, that's clinical thrombocytopenia, you would want to sort of investigate that further if you're concerned. Bleeding time is just a cut on the skin and how long does it take um, for that cut to stop bleeding. Two to five minutes is a normal bleeding time. Not really very helpful, but you can um, send the patient for these examinations. And then screening tools, so the platelet coagulopathies or um, thrombocytopathia, so the quality of the platelets, again, if you are really concerned, you can talk to the hematologist and they can advise for these tests. And um, again, the cause of the altered, <laughs> altered result is far more important than the number. So need to talk to the patient why exactly or how it has happened. Maybe the patient has been an alcoholic and the defect is in the clotting factors and not the platelets. So history is always very important. Now, changes to the medication, only in consultation with the treating physician, because as, as I said before, the risk of bleeding does not outweigh the risk of stroke or acute myocardial infarction. Consult or refer to oral maxillofacial surgery. We are always helpful, hopefully, and we are always ready to take your calls um, anytime about a bleeding patient. Replacement therapy, so again, with, for severe disorders, or a surgery which is really you're expecting that it'll, it's going to bleed a lot, talk to the hematologist, talk about admission to a hospital and backups. Um, and then again, referral to a hospital where there is a dental unit or a maxillofacial unit. So if, this is for everyone, if you are unaware that there is a maxillofacial unit at a particular hospital, just call us up on level four and we'll be able to help you with that. Um, again, intraoperative, this is very important respect anatomy. So if you are going to treat your flap like a dog's breakfast, that's not gonna help. Respect the tissues, respect the anatomy, be gentle in your handling, retraction, raising the flap. Even simple forcep extraction can be quite traumatizing if you do not know how to apply those forceps. So um, you need to really know how, which area you're dealing with. Some tissues are more forgiving than others. If the patient has thin uh, biotype, which is a thin type of gingiva, it's gonna tear. So just try to um, be very gentle with your tissues. Vasoconstrictors, often we are hesitant, thinking that um, patients with cardiac disease, we should not use vasoconstrictor. Please, there is no evidence to suggest that you should stop adrenaline or give plain lignocaine. In fact, we do not stock plain lignocaine up in oral surge. Always use adrenaline um, because that helps with local vasoconstriction. And the amount of adrenaline which re reaches your um, blood finally is far too low to cause any adverse cardiac event. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I'm gonna rush now. Uh, local hemostatic measures. Pressure with the gauze packs, pressure by suturing or tying off the bleeding vessel. So that is if you can see and identify and if the vessel is of sufficient diameter. So if it's a very tiny vessel, um, I don't think so without loops or anything else, you can actually tie it off. Um, apply pressure by crushing the bone. So what we usually do is if it's a bony bleed, we have identified that the uh, bleeding is coming from the mandible itself or the maxilla and we can see where it's coming from but we do not know whether it's a vessel. We just use Mitchell's trimmer or a bone file or any instrument which can crush the bone around it and plug that area with those bony particles. So that is a very good hemostatic agent. Um, again, diathermy or electrosurgery, which is again, it uses the electricity to make the bleeding, uh, the vessels around the soft tissue. 
clot and um, sort of necrose in a way, and then that helps in stopping the bleeding. Hemostatic adjuncts, so they are available in the clinic and in theater. They are all basically physical agents which actually help in collecting the platelets and forming a plug. So they do not promote the clotting because they are not clotting factors. Um, they will not replace the platelets, but what they, are, what they do is they form a network and they attract the platelets and form a plug there. Um, and tranexamic acid, which is again antifibrinolytic. So that is the fourth phase of clot formation. It actually stops the clot from breaking down. Now, if the clot does not form primarily, tranexamic acid is not going to help. So basically, it's, it's really helpful if the clot is formed and it's not really stable enough. So it prevents the degradation of the clot. So these are the agents which we use. That's the surgery cell, which is like a mesh. Um, that's the surgery cell. Um, gel foam and gel tam, they are again cellulose type of materials which are um, platelet, uh, they attract the platelet and they form a plug. So stay calm, which I think is the most important part in controlling bleeding. If you are panicking and if you're fiddling around, you can cause far more damage to the tissues and um, ex exaggerate or exacerbate the event. Pressure, pressure, pressure. So pressure can um, help with any sort of small bleed or even a minor bleed. If it's arterial and if it's pulsatile, obviously it needs something more, but pressure often helps in that initial hemostasis. And once you've sutured that area, the pressure from the clot actually helps in um, the clot to stay there. Normal, it is very normal to bleed once the LA wears off. Why? Because the adrenaline is no more there. So it will ooze. Tell your patients that a normal ooze is expectable. Do not call us or do not panic if it's oozing. It's going to ooze for the rest of the five, five to seven hours or even when you wake up, you might find a pool or a halo of blood around your pillow. That is normal. But if it's excessive or if it worries you, call us. Um, in oral surgery, we usually do not send the patient with gauze in their mouth. We actually wait till the hemostasis is achieved, um, ask them to bite on the gauze for 20 minutes once the hemostasis is achieved, we give them two packs of gauze, sterile gauze, and give them the instructions that do not spit, rinse, do not um, do bungee jumping or gymming uh, for the next 24 hours. This is just to prevent the you know, blood pressure going up or the clot getting disturbed. Do not take any hot drinks, um, ice packs, that will prevent um, vasodilatation. Um, and then, again, bite on the gauze if it's starting to oozing for 20 minutes. Take it out, do not poke or fiddle, put another one. If in two hours time the bleeding doesn't stop, call um, the emergency or um, present at the emergency. So that's um, uh, one question which was raised by, I think, Mel at the discussion, whether to uh, send the patients with gauze. Often we find that if you send the patient with gauze, firstly, you don't have the confidence that the bleeding has stopped. Secondly, the patient is going to spit it out at places where we don't want them to. So again, it's an infection control thing. Tranexamic acid, um, I only would be covering. Um, if the patient presents to the emergency with bleeding, which you do not know the cause of, airway breathing circulation, um, assess for the vitals, and then check where the bleeding is coming from, what's the history. What is really important in these sort of patients is, um, I'm going to skip to that, handover. So once you have assessed the patient, if you do not hand over properly, um, the the, the clinician who is taking over the patient from you is going to waste sometimes a very critical time in really finding out what exactly is happening to this patient. Take the history, um, write proper notes, follow the ISBAR if you can. So ISBAR is identification, identify yourself and the patient. Um, situation, so why, when did the pre patient present to you, in what state? What's your observation about the patient? Even if it's not as complex as this, what's the normal um, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate? Those sort of things. What's the background of the patient? Is he alcoholic, IV drug abuser, hepatitis? Those sort of things. And then assess the patient and then request what you exactly want, that, want to, um, for that patient to be done. And is the patient going to present back to you? Are you going to follow it up? These are the simple things which can um, hasten the process of um, controlling bleeding and also probably prevent a major thrombo ischemic event. And we've already discussed that, so do not panic, rush, 
poke, fiddle, or traumatize. So be gentle. If the patient is coming to you with bleeding or oozing from the mouth, be gentle, <coughs> suction, light, um, and then see where the bleeding is coming from, whether it's soft tissue, bone, or um, where exactly. And then again, delay referring to OMS, so do not delay. Uh, you may be able to control it temporarily, but if the patient is going towards the downward spiral, it's better to refer early um, rather than later on. So know why they bleed, um, and then hassles of the phone call, much better than hassles of complications. And then um, again, basically um, visualize where exactly the bleeding is coming from, and follow the basic hemostatic measures and then refer. So that's it. I hope that was a bit um, informative. Okay, so following on from Kriti, today I'll be discussing how to identify patients that are more likely to bleed and how to manage these patients both pre and post treatment. I'll also discuss when you should be using tranexamic acid mouthwash and how to source the tranexamic as well. So we'll begin with why do patients bleed, which Kriti has already covered as well. Uh, so they can be a greater risk of bleeding during invasive procedures for many reasons. The physiological factors play a major part and aside from some of the more complex conditions that I've listed there, you should consider really simple reasons such as age or weight. So patients of a greater age and a lower weight will be more likely to bleed and this is particularly the case in patients who are also taking antithrombotics. So antithrombotics, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is a term used to encompass both the anticoagulants and the antiplatelets. And so pharmacologically, antithrombotics, non-steroidals, complementary medicines such as high-dose garlic, in devil's claw, uh, can increase patients' bleeding tendency. Today, though, we'll just be focusing on antithrombotics and how to manage these risks. So there are two main classes of medications that increase the bleeding, the anticoagulants and the antiplatelets. Currently in Australia, the antithrombotic most commonly seen in the community setting is warfarin, closely followed by aspirin, clopidogrel and dicagrelor, and then the newer uh, direct oral anticoagulants, otherwise known as the DOAX. Now these ones used to be called the NOAX or the novel anticoagulants, but they're no longer considered new because they've been around for four years, so they're now called the DOAX. Um, when assessing patients pre-procedure, it's vital to take a thorough medication history so that you can uncover if your patient is taking one or even two of these medications in combination. You need to know which drugs they're taking, you should know the current dosage and the indication, and you should also check if they're taking any other medications and their allergy status as well. It should be noticed that, noted that any patients taking the medications that I've listed here in combination with a non-steroidal as well or a complementary medicine will be in an even greater risk of bleeding. Uh, you should also carefully consider post-op pain relief in these patients. They should not be prescribed non such as diclofenac or ibuprofen and it's recommended just to use regular paracetamol and if absolutely necessary short-term opioids. So focusing in now on the DOAX or the direct oral anticoagulants. So these are relatively new medications. Uh, they've just been listed on the PBS in 2012 and they're commonly used as an alternative to warfarin. So they fall into two broad categories, the direct thrombin inhibitors such as dabigatrin and the factor 10A inhibitors such as rivaroxaban and apixaban. As you can see in the diagram, the direct thrombin inhibitors in inactivate soluble and fibrin brown thrombin and the limit the thrombogenesis and the thrombus gross growth, whereas the factor 10A inhibitors directly inhibit the enzyme responsible for the thrombin formation. So these medicines offer some advantages over the traditional warfarin as Kriti went into. Um, so regular blood tests are unnecessary and there's a low risk of food interactions, which usually causes a lot of concern with warfarin in terms of the vitamin K content in diet. Um, however, they also present a lot of new challenges. Um, there are no current lab tests to monitor the extent of anticoagulation, and we have no way of predicting which patients on DOAX will bleed more uh, during any kind of surgery. So there are some lab tests that will help determine whether there's any effect of the diet present, but these results will not reveal the extent of the hemostatic impairment. So we briefly earlier touched on the physiological factors, and as an example, the risk of bleeding during therapy with dabigatrin 
uh, is increased in patients aged greater than 75 years and those that weigh less than 50 kilograms and those with renal impairment, so an EGFR of 30 to 50 mLs per minute. Uh, the risk of bleeding increases markedly when these DOACs are combined with other drugs such as antiplatelets, anticoagulants, non steroidals um, and the complementary meds as well. The other challenge that we face with the DOACs is that there previously has been no medication to reverse their anticoagulant effect. Uh, with warfarin we have established guidelines of care for warfarin reversal. But as of June 1st this year, the Therapeutic Goods Administration approved the first reversal agent for the DOAX uh, called Praxbind or Idiruzumab. Uh, so this is a monoclonal antibody fragment which binds dabigatrin. Uh, it can bind free and thrombin bound dabigatrin and it neutralises its activity so it reverses its anticoagulant effect. Prior to this approval, uh, the management of bleeding on dabigatrin and the other two uh, DOACs was limited to dialysis or supportive treatment with blood products, uh, which was usually only ever partially effective. Uh, currently, there's still no reversal agent available for rivaroxaban or apixaban, so these ones still need supportive measures only. Okay, so should antithrombotics be ceased pre-dental procedure? Simple answer is no. Um, according to the cardiology therapeutic guidelines, thrombosis initiates the clinical events that lead to the most deaths and ill health worldwide. In most circumstances, ceasing an antithrombotic drug has a greater potential harm than continuing it. However, you should always discuss this management uh, with your patient pre-procedure as most patients are very aware of their bleeding risks and if warfarin has been started in a hospital, they'll most likely be carrying a warfarin card that advises them to discuss their do dosing with all health practitioners, particularly prior to surgical procedures. And the last thing we want is a patient who self-ceases their antithrombotic because they're worried about bleeding during your surgery. Uh, you should always warn your patients that they will have a higher chance of bruising while they stay on their regular medications but this risk is minor compared with the risk of embolism and death. Now, obviously this advice is only for patients prior to low risk dental procedures and for more invasive procedures, there are established guidelines for ceasing antithrombotics and transitioning via bridging therapy to heparin or anoxaparin in the perioperative period. So if you are facing anything other than a minor dental procedure, you must consult with a haematologist or a pharmacist. So given that we're not going to change any of the doses of a patient's antithrombotics prior to dental surgery, what can we do to minimise the bleeding? Critty has already discussed uh, the local measures that can be used and now I'll tell you a little bit about tranexamic acid mouthwash as well. So tranexamic acid mouthwash is used primarily for patients on warfarin and patients on the DOAX. And for warfarin patients, it's quite simple. You need to test the INR within 24 hours prior to your dental surgery, and the INR re result will guide your treatment. So as you can see, for an INR greater than 2.2, tranexamic acid mouthwash should be used in conjunction with the local me measures. If a patient's INR comes back as greater than 4, you should not proceed with the surgery although Kriti has said in oral stage they go up to 4.5. Um, and you should call the patient's GP or their specialist to help coordinate the patient's care. In terms of an INR of that size, you need to consider a dose reduction or even a reversal in terms of vitamin K if they have active bleeding at the time. So for patients on DOAX, as we discussed, there's no way of assessing the, the extent of their anticoagulation. And so we have to assume that all patients prescribed DOAX will have an increased risk of bleeding. And at RDHM, all patients that are taking a DOAC are considered to be in the same high bleeding risk category as patients on warfarin for an INR greater than 2.2. So basically, if your patient is on warfarin, apixaban, dabigatrin or rivaroxaban, you should use tranexamic acid mouthwash. For patients on the other th antithrombotics, such as antiplatelets and heparins, currently tranexamic acid is not recommended as a standard therapy. Uh, you should just use local measures. But this treatment plan may change with further studies uh, and it's very reasonable to use your clinical judgment knowing that tranexamic acid mouthwash is an effective tool to help achieve hemostasis.
So tranexamic acid is an antifibrinolytic that works by slowing the processes that cause bleeding. As you can see in panel A, in the absence of tranexamic acid, plasminogen binds to fibrin at the lysine binding site, and in the presence of TPA, it's converted to plasmin. The plasmin is then able to break down the fibrin filaments. In panel B, where we have tranexamic acid present, you can see that it binds to the plasminogen and it's activated plasmin form, and so it blocks the binding sites, and so you stop the breakdown of uh, fibrin. In Australia, uh, tranexamic acid is available both as oral tablets and as a solution for injection. So in general practice, tranexamic acid is used broadly to prevent excessive bleeding in patients. And I've listed some of the approved indications here for you. Uh, the usual dose for the oral tablets is around two to three tablets two to three times a day. So the maximum daily systemic dose is around 4.5 grams per day. And this is compared with our topical only mouthwash of five grams and 100 ml over two days. So relatively low compared to the oral systemic dose. Uh, tranexamic acid is eliminated mainly untacked in the urine and its half-life is about two hours. So I've list, list, listed here some precautions to systemic use, um, but there's very limited data for the precautions for topical use. Um, one study has shown that plasma concentration post-mouthwash post use was really low, was two microgram per mil versus seven microgram per mil after an oral dosing. And so how relevant these systemic precautions are for topical use is really open to further studies given that it's not getting into the systemic uh, system. So the contraindications for use include the allergy to tranexamic acid and the presence of a pre-existing colour vision problem as well. So we know how tranexamic acid works, we just need to get some. Uh, so I know this can be an issue both within the hospital and out in the community setting as well. Uh, the best option is to call your local pharmacy well prior to needing the medication and you should set up an arrangement for supply on the understanding that this may not occur for many months. It's not commonly used in the community and so many pharmacies don't keep it as a stock item. The other option is to source from a specialised compounding pharmacy and arrange delivery. Once all of the requirements are in place, it's a relatively, relatively quick uh, to make it up at short notice. So at RDHM, we've got an arrangement with Health Smart Pharmacy at VCCC uh, to supply us with tranexamic acid mouthwash. And because of the volume that we are using, uh, they've found it's more efficient to use the tranexamic acid powder, as uh, there's no need to filter out all the excipients that won't dissolve and this results in a crystal clear mouthwash. The powder is very expensive to purchase, uh, so it's not an option for community pharmacies that, pharmacies that only use it occasionally. Uh, at RDHM, before supplying the mouthwash, you should make a note in the patient's record, enter a 9270 into titanium, and record this dispensing on a log sheet that we're soon to put into the impress cupboards next to the mouthwash. Okay, so the second option is to make it yourself. Now, inside the hospital, this one is not recommended as we should always have the mouthwash available in the cupboard. Um, so it should only be when you can't get the pre-made solution or when a patient is unable to present to a pharmacy to have the mouthwash supplied. If you are using the DIY option, you'll need to purchase lightproof bottles with child safe caps. You'll need sterile water and a label that complies with all the legislative requirements of the Drugs and Poisons Unit. This way of manufacturing creates a really gritty product and hopefully you can see on the top photo there that on the left is the product that's been made up with the powder and has been filtered and the other version on the right is the gritty version. So both of these options will need a script to be written for an individual patient, uh, either for the mouthwash or for the tablets to be dispersed. If you have an option, then a pre-made solution is the simpler and safer choice. I've recently called up quite a few different pharmacies, um, and there's pharmacies in Carlton, Seddon and Paran who are all able to fill a script at short notice. So when you're supplying the mouthwash, you should counsel the patient on how to use it, and also a supply measuring cup and written instructions. 
you need to make sure you consider the to total volume required uh, in that 100 ml will only last 10 ml QID for two and a half days. You should advise patients again to let the mouthwash dribble out of their mouths uh, so they take care not to forcibly spit and dislodge their clot. If a patient does swallow the mouthwash, they'll be receiving a dose of 500 milligrams QID, which is something to be avoided in patients who are already taking medications to reduce their risk of thrombus formation. So you really need to emphasise again, do not swallow. So in conclusion, at your first meeting with your patient, you should take a thorough medication history so you can identify any antithrombotics that your patient's taking, any other medications and their allergies. You should reassure your patient that you will not be changing their antithrombotic and there's no need for them to miss any of their doses prior to their procedure. During the procedure, use the local measures that Kriti went through earlier to control the bleeding and if clinically indicated, you can either prescribe or supply the tranexamic acid mouthwash. You should always give written information, which we're getting together now as a consumer medicines information leaflet to give out to patients, and this should include a number to call in case of emergency if they do begin bleeding again. Uh, and last of all, you should arrange a follow-up within two days of surgery to check on their ongoing bleeding and their signs of infection. Okay, thank you. I think we've got a pretty good um, history. Uh, excluding the medication. So we would like to know, <laughs> and that um, uh, when Kriti alluded to medications, we said uh, there are medications that we'd be having for um, anticoagulants, but also this person might be on Nurofen. And so there are, there are other medications that we need to be aware of. And um, Blood pressure just, medications. Yeah, yeah, the blood pressure medication, we'd like to know what that is uh, and the effects of that. Um, when the family member is a lawyer, it's probably worse than when there's just a nurse in the family. <laughs> just joking about that, that's not relevant. Uh, but a 93-year-old, um, uh, if you get a 25-year-old healthy person and they lose 500 mils of blood, uh, their blood pressure is not going to go down, they're not, their heart rate's not even going to be affected. Uh, they donate blood, they're going to get a cookie and uh, uh, Kool-Aid and away they go. Uh, a 93 year old, if they lose 500 mils of blood, that can be significant, and we said also uh, a little kid. So it depends who is losing the blood and how much they're losing, and comorbidities. Do they have other problems um, where that's going to be important? So um, the fact the dentist chose to put in surgery cell, um, ordinarily you probably, if, the, if a portion of the a buccal plate came with when you take the tooth out, um, that's not really an indication to put in surgery cell. So I think. It's possible that there could have been an ooze at the time, uh, which is why they decided to put in the surgery cell, and then they've sutured it. Um, um, again, you want to know that the, you've achieved primary hemostasis before the patient leaves, and so put the pressure on that, explain to the family members how to take care of the patient, um, and when the patient returns to a nursing home, it's all good. Uh, continuous ooze. Um, it's something that we didn't that we didn't mention here that uh, that I like to do. If you've got a patient who uh, you think they either they algae or they um, have a potential for uh, oozing afterwards, I don't like to see them on Friday afternoon because I don't want my weekend wrecked and I don't want to wreck someone else's weekend. So if you've got a patient like this, you want to get them in for a morning appointment. And even patients who uh, we all know about the um, circadian rhythms and uh, patient who's on um, I'm digressing. Bottom line, uh, get them in in the morning, uh, have somebody observe them, have somebody with them, and the same goes for special needs patients, because we say little kids will bite their lip, uh, tell mom, please watch this kid, uh, if they bite their lip, uh, you need to keep an eye on them, and the same special needs patients and elderly patients, keep an eye on them. If they're getting that ooze, we want to um, address it early, and she shouldn't have been left alone all night. If she starts using, we want to address it early. I'd just like to make a couple of general comments. We've got a 91-year-old person here. But before I start that, in, uh, in 2000, there was an interesting paper which said serious embolic complications, including death, were three times more likely to occur in patients whose anticoagulant therapy was interrupted. So for the last 16 years at least, we know that we shouldn't interrupt our 
anticoagulant therapy because the, it's three times the risk if you stop it. Now, the other thing is in the past, people used to stop it and go on to heparin, or low molecular weight heparin, thinking that they could keep the patient coagulated but have a reversible agent on board in case something went wrong. Well, that's found to be the worst thing possible because the death rate was a lot higher if somebody stopped the oral anticoagulant and went on to a reversible anticoagulant. So those two things I just wanted to add to the previous talk. Now, in England, over a third of the patients seeking emergency dental treatment had a medica, medical comorbidity, the most common being a cardiovascular disorder, which are frequently managed by anticoagulants and antiplatelet medications. So that anybody who's old who comes in with a medical problem, now over a third of these will be on anticoagulants. They may not tell you that because they might be old and you might not be able to get a proper history. But that's the first thing you should be aware of, that an old person coming in is most likely on, anti, on some sort of anticoagulant. Now, there are diseases which cause increased bleeding, and amongst them are SLE, seizures, people who are on valproic acid, hypothyroidism, and anybody with kidney, liver, or bone marrow disease has an increased incidence of bleeding. Now, anybody who's 90 years old and who's, on, who's got heart failure has most likely got other associated diseases. So when you see an old person, you just assume that they're going to bleed and you take every possible precaution, including transexamic acid. Now, the other thing is this lady, she, admit, she was admitted to casualty or saw a hospital in the morning. And I find the biggest problem is explaining to people what a normal amount of bleeding is and what an abnormal amount of bleeding is and when should you start being worried. So we had a discussion yesterday and perhaps we should actually say to people that if you have one gauze pack and it's full, then you don't, bleed, you don't worry if the bleeding stops. But if you have two or three attempts at stopping the bleeding and it's still bleeding, then go and see somebody. Don't wait and don't go to sleep. We've had two cases here that were sent off with the normal explanation. One of them presented to a hospital with a haemoglobin of six, and one of them had a myocardial infarct at night because they bled so much. They both said that they didn't know what was an abnormal amount of bleeding. And at night time especially, if they swallow the blood, you can't really tell. So perhaps we should have a more detailed description of when patients should be concerned about the amount of bleeding. Now that's something for you to decide, but I think just saying that if you're worried about bleeding, contact us is not sufficient for these patients. Um, now, people, and the, and the other thing I'd like to mention is people with kidney disease and liver disease, even though their blood profiles, all the tests you do could be completely normal, these people are still going to bleed. The bleeding times and the tests that we perform do not actually indicate whether the patient is going to bleed or not. We do it, I think, now mainly for medico-legal reasons because they don't really help us to decide whether a patient's going to bleed or not. If the tests are normal, it means nothing. If they're abnormal, then you can say they're going to bleed. But you can still bleed a tremendous amount with normal tests. Now, there was a question which I'll bring about dialysis, people who have got renal dialysis. The problem is they get heparin when they have dialysis. So you don't want to operate on them immediately that they've had their dialysis. But if you wait too long, they develop uremia before their next dialysis, and then they still get bleeding problems due to the uremia. So the recommendation is that you do the, the uh, renal dialysis <coughs> patient the following morning after they've had their dialysis. And that seems to be the best thing. Now, all, all these things I'm most concerned about is that people in the peripheral clinics will see these patients. And one of the things that happens, they have to have time to look at the patient's medications, go to MIMS, look up what these new medications are, because there are new medications being developed all the time.
there's a new one released in June this year, which has got a completely different action to any of the above medications. And to ask a clinician to actually have access to MIMS, look up and find out whether it causes bleeding or not, I think is something that we have to stress. That we don't operate on anybody unless we've seen all their medications and we're sure we know the action of all the medications. So in this particular case, this lady at the age of 90 had a lot of reasons to bleed. And I think that it's, I'm not surprised that she presented the next morning. We really have to make sure that we stress to the people that it's a, it's a serious problem. If they're concerned, go earlier rather than later to seek help. That's all. Okay, any questions for the panel on that scenario one? Um, I think something else that um, we didn't really talk about there is that um, it's all, you don't say, oh, INR, INR is 2.2, we'll give them a tranexamic acid and we'll take out 22 teeth. Um, <laughs> again, we're looking at what, who is this patient, what is their age, what are their comorbidities, all of this, uh, is this a good idea? Uh, and mm. so you say, um, we have to take everything into account because if they've got a cardiac valve um, replacement and you're going to have to give antibiotic prophylaxis, it's not something you want to be getting them back again and again and again for. So uh, think about it, plan it, and Excellent. that's good. Yeah. And when the patient comes back and they're, and they're oozing, um, we want to get rid of the relatives, um, focus on the patient, get the light in, get access, um, remove that big jelly blob and see where it's coming from. I was, uh, talking to Tony, pop your fingers on the sides of the socket, give it a, put some pressure on there. If it stops bleeding, <coughs> it's probably soft tissue. Uh, we're going to get away with probably just putting in um, mattress suture, and that's good. Um, if it carries on bleeding, is it coming from the bone? Where is it coming from? Then we're going to crush it. Um, give the local. Uh, there are people who say don't give local anaesthetic because uh, when the vasoconstrictor wears off, it's going to stop. It's going to start bleeding again. Um, the the problem with bleeding, if you've got uh, the whole point is stasis. So if you're going to stop the flow, uh, it's, it, it doesn't help if a clot forms on top of the thing that's running down the road, that's no good. The clot needs to be, you need to get hemostasis initially. So um, if you've got a host pipe that's leaking a, a large volume of fluid, you've got to stop that first. So happy to put in the local. Um, yeah, go on to the next one. Um, Tony, I'm glad you brought up sodium valproate. In a lot of patients, it's one of the first line drugs for patients with chronic pain. So that could be younger people too. So I just wanted to bring that up because it, it, we do have a lot of people with chronic pain too that's why they're on disability pensions and so forth. I think generally if a person's unwell for some reason or other it's not as simple they're unwell because of this particular condition when they're unwell everything gets reduced in its effectiveness and people who have coughs and colds you'll find that they often bleed more but there's not a direct relationship between the virus causing the bleeding. It's the fact that their whole metabolism has been altered. So people who are unwell for any reason are more likely to bleed, which isn't sort of generally discussed or recorded. I'll start with this one again. So we've got a um, special needs patient and w at this hospital we see a lot of special needs patients and we say to ourselves they've uh, had two roots taken out and you might think that it's not necessary to pop in sutures for someone who's had two roots taken out but um, if a patient's under general anaesthetic and or even under local anaesthetic and we've got them comfortable in the chair I would say it's prudent to do the best that you can uh, to prevent uh, an adverse outcome and so I would have definitely put in the sutures there as well because it's, if they come back and they've got a bleed it's going to be difficult uh, they've come back now. Um, but I would have put those sutures in, that's good. Um, again, as I said, with a youngster that, who could bite their lip while it's numb, uh, we want to keep an eye on these people. Uh, I was talking to Tony, clearly you can't keep an eye on someone for 24 hours a day, so I don't think this is something that's unavoidable. I think it's just something that we need to be aware of that these things happen. And when this patient comes in, we're going to have to manage it. So you're going to numb it suture it again and have the discussion with them that they may be annoying but we need them and 
that Tony said possibly that we might have left the ends of that too long but if it's gone across a socket and they're playing with it like a guitar string well they need to leave it alone. Um, Inverted sutures sometimes helps. Yeah. So don't leave the ends sticking out, put them inside, yeah. tuck them in as much as possible, get and, and overlap if you can, if the tissue allow, overlap a little yeah. bit so there is no gap for them to play on a guitar. Yeah. And instead of putting interrupters across the mm. uh, socket, I'd put a horizontal mattress so that, and then um, your pieces that go across would be up against the tooth on either side, so they're less likely to even be able to hook that. The other thing is that this patient is a schizophrenic and he's obviously on medication. Mm -hmm. Now the medications that affect blood clotting and increase bleeding are the SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft and a lot of people are on them. Tricyclic antidepressants and the phenothiazines which is the sort of the major tranquilizer group which a lot of these patients are on. So these people are more likely to bleed and they're also more likely to muck around with the bleeding site and put their fingers in and do everything. So these people are, there's no, um, there's nothing we can do about it except take great care during the procedure and then explain to the carers or whoever it is that there's a big possibility that there may be problems afterwards and can they please keep an eye on them and if there's any problems to come straight back. But basically these people because of their anxiety state and the fact they're on the medications which increase bleeding are at greater risk for problems post-op.